Good morning. Let's stand on our feet. Let's sing together to a God who is always worthy of our praise, of our adoration, of our thanksgiving. And we know, we know that this time that we get to be together this morning was ordained by a great God. So let's give a great God great praise this morning. Amen. Come on, amen. Amen. They'll praise you up in that silence is the enemy. They'll praise you up in that conquer. on singing. Let's keep on praising. Let's sing the song that all of heaven has been singing for all of eternity. Holy, holy, holy.
generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all have gone before us, and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. It's your name. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all, and the angels cry.
know there's um as we were singing i was i was thinking about how blessed we are to serve a holy god holy forever since before time began he'll move on through time being forever holy and Maybe for some of us we know what holiness means, but maybe for some of us we don't, but holiness can't have anything to do with sin. It's like trying to mix oil and, and water, like they just can't, they cannot be. We believe that we are sin, sinners, but saved by the grace of God through the blood of Jesus, through the cross of Christ. And I was thinking just how beautiful it is that a holy God who can have nothing to do with sin would be so kind and invite us into his family, invite us into his, into his presence despite our sin by making a way through Jesus. Us being in this room today, I always want to talk against apathy. This is not just a privilege to live in a country where we can do this, but this is a privilege that a holy God had make a way for you and I to be here today. And when if our hearts are truly filled with gratitude, then we sound different, then we live different, then we look different, then we walk through these doors different. So what I wanna do is I wanna encourage us right now with just to close our eyes. And right now, just think of one thing, just one thing thing you are thankful for. Life is hard. I get it. But God is good. God is kind. And he is inviting you and me and us together into a moment to give him the praise he deserves. He is holy forever. We want to praise him, not because we have to, but because we are grateful for what he has done and who he is. Thank you, God, for who you are. Thank you for the cross. Oh, my words fall short. I've got nothing more. How could I? As I let your heart of thanks sing out, but every and you never do. He's holy forever. Come on, let's sing. So I. Sometimes you can 
What a blessing it is to uh, just hear the voices all over this room as we, we come together each week and we sing praises to the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and it's just, it's just a wonderful thing and privilege that we get to do, and we have the freedom to come and worship the one true King. So we're so glad that you are here this morning. If you, Maybe you've been visiting with us and we haven't made a connection with you. We would love to connect with you right after the service for just a couple of minutes, give you a gift as a way of saying thank you for being with us this morning, taking some of your morning out to come and worship with us. Also, to answer any questions that you may have, and if you are online or on TV from the beach or the mountains or in your living room, we're so glad that you carved out part of your morning to tune in and be with us as well. Well, one of the things that is very important to us here at Owensboro Christian Church is community. And we have an event that is actually happening today that you don't have to sign up for, but it's Cookout at the Creek, and it's at Yellow Creek Park, and it's from 5 to 7 this afternoon. We have a catered meal. We have live music. We've reserved the entire park. Uh, for our church gathering, and the, and the pavilion that we use is right next to the spray park, so the kids can come out there, they can get wet, you can eat a bunch of food, and enjoy that community and get to know other people here at our church. We do have a pickleball tournament, and we also have a cornhole tournament. The only kicker is, if you want to play in the tournament, you have to sign up by 1 p.m. today, so we have to shut down the registration online or on the app, so if you want to play, we would love for you to be a part, but we want to make sure that we have the brackets ready to go when everyone gets there this afternoon. Another way to get plugged in here at Owensboro Christian Church is through membership pathway. So maybe, maybe you've been coming for a long time, or maybe you've just been coming here recently, and you're like, I want to know more about the church. I want to get plugged in. I want to know what opportunities there are to serve here at OCC. Uh, that is on August the 25th. And it is during our 915 service, this service, so you could come, membership pathway, and then you could attend the 1045 service. We do ask that you sign up on the app or on the website, but just a great connect point. It's casual. They have juice, coffee, and donuts, and just an opportunity for you to really find out what is going on here at OCC. We are so glad that Scott is back this morning, and uh, he has got a... Wonderful message for you as we kick off our new series called Home Away From Home. So grab your Bible or your Bible app at this time.
Well, good morning. It is uh, really great to see you this morning. Uh, as Tom said, my name is Scott. I want to get to serve as one of the pastors here. And if this is your first weekend ever at Owensboro Christian Church, I want to extend a special welcome to you. If you've been with us for the past uh, few weeks for the first time, I have not. Uh, each summer, uh, I take just a, a brief study break. I've been doing that since I arrived in 2013. This year, uh, we spent a few days in Indiana with family. We did take a week of vacation uh, down at Panama City Beach, which was the first time my boys had ever seen the ocean. So that was cool to see that through the lens of a, a six-year-old and a two-year-old. Backed into a palm tree while I was there. And apart from that and the following insurance claim, it was a wonderful, uh, wonderful trip. Uh, apart from that time, you know, we were in Owensboro. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of reading, a lot of planning and praying uh, for, the, for the future is how I spent my, my time. And I, I want to thank you as a church for that time. That is good for me as a leader. That's good for us as a church because this is a shared leadership. It's not about any one person. And we have a lot of great teachers here. And did, didn't Tom Harrigan and John Bales do a great job finishing up Fruits of the Spirit series? Very thankful for them, very thankful for our staff, and thankful for, for you because, uh, honestly, what makes a church uh, is its people. And so I'm thankful that this place is what it is because of you. And um, it is good to be back. August, whew, August is upon us. That means the start of school. If you are a parent, you say, yay! You know, soon will follow um, fall, fall to come on the, the heels. That means football season, yay! If you're a football fan, and then later this fall, there will also be cooler weather. It was like, yay! And then, then 2024, it also means an election cycle. Oh, right? Like mixed emotions when it comes to uh, election years. My, my approach to election seasons uh, has always been to encourage us as a church to keep our eyes higher, right? So we, we participate in democracy without deifying it. And what that means is be engaged, be informed, care, right? Do your part to, to vote, all while recognizing no political party represents the full and perfect will of God. And no political leader is your true hope. None of them keep all their promises, which means you and I and the world needs a truer hope and a greater promise keeper. And that's what we find in Jesus Christ. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords to whom one day every knee will bow in heaven on earth and under the earth to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Amen. And so in, in light of that, as we enter this season, in a time when not everyone will be charitable, we want to be charitable. In a time when not everybody will be loving, we want to be loving even when we disagree with others or even when we disagree among our Selves. And so in that spirit, what we're going to do over the next few weeks, not all fall, but for the next few weeks, is we're going to look at the New Testament letter of 1 Peter, and also we're going to parallel that with some highlights from the life of Daniel. So we have, we have New Testament and Old Testament. We have epistle, like a letter written to a New Testament church, and we have an historical narrative um, from the Bible, Daniel's life. Peter gives us some really helpful guidance for navigating uh, an increasingly confusing world, Daniel puts a lot of those principles into practice. So, so Peter is prescribing for the church. Daniel, although he came several hundred years prior, um, he is practicing. And so both of those books alone are very, very helpful for us. But taken together, I pray these two books will give us a nice path for walking through um, what could be a contentious season in our country or in our world, doing so in a way that honors the Lord. And I wanna start this morning in Daniel. Now, we're gonna be in Daniel chapter two, if you have a Bible or a Bible app, that's where we're gonna begin. We'll look in Daniel chapter one um, next week. I'm doing it a little bit out of order. But the book of Daniel begins with the people of Judah. So that's God's people falling to a king named Nebuchadnezzar and then being taken as exiles to live in a nation called Babylon. Babylon is essentially um, modern-day Iraq, and so they're taken from Israel to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar's victory would have been all over the news of the day. You know, Babylon and its gods have defeated Israel and its god. And for all intents and purposes, it would have seemed to the naked eye pretty obvious that God's people had been defeated and that God's kingdom had fallen. But in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. It's a terrifying 
dream, which eventually changes the way that he thinks about um, the God of the Bible and thinks about God's, um, we might call God's eternal kingdom, along with the way he thinks about his own rule and his own national kingdom. And Daniel chapter two should do something similar for us. Daniel two should change the way we think about temporary national kingdoms and rulers in relationship to the kingdom of God. And the Hebrew language in Daniel 2, I know unless you're Artie Marks, very few of us speak Hebrew, but the Hebrew in, in Daniel 2 is very, very interesting. It literally says the dream knocked the wind out of the king. I don't know if you've ever had a dream where you just have woken up like, <gasps> kind of woken up with a gasp. I had one, um, not last night, but two nights ago, when my wife reached over at three in the morning and grabbed my face. She <laughs> reached over. Um, I, I was in the midst of a dream. I don't know if the, I don't know how that work. If I just if it all happened just very quick, but I dreamt I was at a summer camp. I was helping just take care of a group of kids sleeping like in different bunks, and that someone needed me, and they woke me up by grabbing my face. And it turns out it was my wife. I assumed that I was snoring, so I just kind of muffed and rolled over. And then when I brought it up in the morning, she was like, "Oh dear, did I grab your face?" She said she was trying to rescue one, in her dream rescue one of the kids. She reached out to grab the kids, and just happened to be my face. So. Um, I, I woke up oh, with a great gasp. You probably have done something similar. Nebuchadnezzar um, experiences this as well. Knocked the wind out of him. This dream was like a punch in the gut. And it troubled him so much that he had, he had two requests. He, he gathered together all the, ma the magicians, the enchanters, the astrologers in the land, gave them two requests. He said, one, tell me my dream. And then two, give me its interpretation. Now, as you can imagine, they did not like this very much. They said, oh king, live forever, you are awesome and majestic. They said, you, how about you tell us your dream and then we will give you a fitting interpretation. They figure if they hear the content of the dream, they can go you know, counsel their symbology charts and their astrology books and they can come up with a interpretation that the king would accept. But Nebuchadnezzar is on to their, you know, how all of this works and so he says, no. He goes, you tell me my dream, then you give me the interpretation and I know that you, you are legit. And when they cannot do this, he is livid. And so we pick up in Daniel chapter two, verse 12. It says this, it says that because of this, the king was angry and very furious, and he commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So off with their heads, he's going to, to kill the wise men. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Now if you never read Daniel before, that may not, you know, make entire sense who all these people are. Daniel was one of the people of Judah. He'd been taken to live in Babylon. So he, he's not exactly one of the king's wise men, but he has been educated in the Babylonian system. We'll read about that next week in Daniel 1. And so he, he's kind of part of this, this group in the king's court. And so Daniel is about to be killed alongside with all of these wise men. But Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? He's trying to buy some time. Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. So we get the sense that Daniel sort of bust into the king's quarters. Uh, this was a very gutsy move by Daniel. You don't just, um, don't just charge in on a king to request an appointment. Uh, the king, for his, um, for his strength, could have had Daniel's head on a platter on the spot. But if you think about it, Daniel is going to be killed uh, anyway. So there's not, a, there's not a whole lot of risk, I guess, to Daniel's action. The only thing that stopped the king from killing Daniel right there and then was that Daniel had already proven his worth. Daniel, over time, had earned the king's respect. And we'll, we'll talk about that um, in the midst of this series. But for now, it's enough to note that when you demonstrate to people in positions of authority, it could be your boss, uh, it could be a teacher, it could be you know, a community leader, it could be a parent or a grandparent. If, if you demonstrate to someone in authority that you are a person of character, that you work hard, that you are trustworthy, when you then go to talk with them about important matters or make a difficult request of them, they will be much more open to listen. And so Daniel, being this sort of person, goes to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar obliges Daniel's request for a time in which he can explain the dream. And as soon as this happened, Daniel and his friends start to, to pray. 
and they beg that the God of the universe will, will give them clarity as to what the king dreamed and what it means. And God answers their prayer by revealing to them these two things. And this is where the story starts to get really, really interesting. I want to invite you to stand with me as I read Daniel 2, starting in verse 26. We're going to get a sense here of the dream and its meaning. Uh, this, is, this is sort of a strange uh, passage of scripture, but we're standing out of respect for God's word. We want to receive what God has for us, even through something that may seem a little bit confusing at first, but we'll talk about it. So Daniel 2, verse 26, the king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, they had changed Daniel's name, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and in its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, I love this, no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. He says in verse 31, you saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you look, a stone was cut out by no human hand. We're gonna come back to that in a few minutes. Verse 34, stone cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might and the glory and the in whose hand he is given wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you. And yet a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom strong as iron because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. We're going to stop right there for now. We'll pick up a few verses later in a moment. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. That is, uh, I am aware, a lot to take in. Um, you know, not obvious what Daniel is talking about. Um, this is what we would call um, biblical prophecy. And I'm, we're going to walk through what it means. It may help if we visualize what Daniel describes. We're told that the head of gold symbolizes King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. So that's a, that's a very helpful starting point for us. We're told that in the dream, the Babylonian Empire had existed um, in different forms for, for several centuries. Um, in its current iteration, really around the 7th century BC, so close to the time of Daniel. But we're told this was the head of gold that the Nebuchadnezzar sees in his dream. And then the rest of the statue we glean from two places. One, the rest of the book of Daniel, because Daniel later says what some of this means. But then also from, from world history. So the kingdom which followed Babylon, the second kingdom, the kingdom of silver, the chest and arms made of silver, was the Medo-Persian Empire. They historically followed the nation of Babylon. The third kingdom which followed the Medo-Persians made of bronze symbolizes the Greek Empire which followed Persia. And the fourth kingdom made of iron is Rome. The Roman Empire followed Alexander the Great and the Greeks. Most biblical scholars and historians agree upon this interpretation, you have Babylon, you have Persia, you have Greece, and then you have Rome. Even if you want to veer away from the traditional view, what's very clear from this is these are human kingdoms, all right? These are human kingdoms that Nebuchadnezzar dreams about. What's important for us is that after these four human kingdoms, we are told of another kingdom that's distinct. Verse 34, not cut by human hands, which means this is a kingdom not of human origin, but divine origin. And we're told this kingdom will start very, very, very small. And it will seem inconsequential compared to such an impressive statue. In fact, next to these four earthly kingdoms, you would probably not have any reason to notice this small stone at all. And yet by the end of the dream, we realize that this little teeny rock is the key to the dream's interpretation. 
So just a few verses later in Daniel 2, it says in verse 44, and in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever, just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this, this dream, the dream is certain, and its interpretation is true. Now, we were just gonna kind of cut through all of this to kind of get to the heart um, of this message and then into 1 Peter. Here is the message or the truth for us. God's kingdom will often seem small, insignificant, and non-threatening in the shadow of man-made kingdoms, but the kingdom of God will outlast every empire history has known. Alexander the Great built an impressive kingdom in just 13 years only to die of illness and then have his kingdom spread among four lesser leaders who drove it all into the ground. Hitler's Third Reich was brutally terrifying, but it lasted a paltry 12 years. My cars last longer than that. I drive them longer. I'm not trying to make light of what he did. What, 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 what he and um, his Reich did was, was, was awful destruction, but it all fell after a few hundred, or after, um, it fell as quickly as it rose. Rome thought itself to be indestructible, but it fell after only a few hundred years. America has been a world power now for 200 plus years. I, I love our country. I hope it continues strong, but it will not last forever. All right, it is not eternal. All man-made kingdoms eventually end, and yet God's kingdom continues to expand. All right, this is the dream in Daniel too. And did you know that when Jesus wanted to identify himself as the promised one of God, the Messiah to come, he would sometimes describe himself as the small rejected rock that was predicted in the Old Testament. Even more telling, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, a time when Rome still ruled the world, so this fourth kingdom in the, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has, Jesus preached his first sermon. Guess what he said? This was the content of his first sermon. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The kingdom that Jesus declared in Mark chapter one is the same kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed about 600 years prior. Jesus Christ and his gospel are the rock which will smash all other kingdoms before growing to fill the earth. Now here's what this should remind you and I. You and I see history from a very limited perspective we become fixated with what's taking place right, right here in front of our face, at home, work, school, certainly in our news feed and what's going on in the world. Um, God sees history from the perspective of eternity. He has the big picture in mind. And the, the Bible word we would use for this is the word sovereign. Sovereign is simply a way of saying that although life has its ups and downs and twists and turns, confusing and scary moments, God remains in control. And this is really, really good news for us. A lot has happened in the, a lot has happened since I last preached, six weeks ago. There's a lot of turmoil on our soil. There's a lot of turmoil overseas. We feel as close to global conflict as I can recall. All, all of this causes fear and anxiety and uncertainty about the future. And even if all the present conflicts should somehow easily resolve, you can expect there are gonna be new headlines a year from now, a week from now. I forget a year, like there will be new crises, new battles, new leaders making decisions that affect your daily life. Someone's candidate will win in November, someone's candidate will lose in November. Guess what? God will still be in control. All right, he will still be in control. And this is why Jesus invites us to view the world through his lens, the lens of the kingdom. Repent and believe, Jesus says. Because the kingdom has come near, repent and believe. That certainly involves this even primarily involves this personal repentance, that we repent of our sin before a holy God so that we can receive the grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. But in light of the message of the coming kingdom, repent and believe also means that we don't let our mood ebb and flow with every news report, every election cycle, or even every personal trial. We have a foundation as the people of God, a foundation of security, steadiness and trust that stems from the grace, goodness, and power of God. And so we repent, we stop doing things our own way, we stop blindly following the winds of the culture, 
We don't get swept up in all the things that other people get swept up in. The kingdom of God changes our perspective. Now that doesn't mean that nothing else matters. It doesn't mean that we don't care about current issues. It doesn't mean that we don't do our part to enact change, but it does mean that while we do so, we keep our eyes higher. And we keep our eyes higher even when we don't understand what's taking place. And we keep our eyes higher even when we disagree again with others or among ourselves, even when it seems like evil has won the day because we know evil will not have the last word. And although national powers jostle for position, we know God's kingdom has come and God's kingdom will prevail. That's Daniel chapter two. Very important chapter in the Old Testament. When we turn to the New Testament, to letters like 1 Peter, what we find is that Peter picks up on the language of the book of Daniel and picks up on some of the same themes from Daniel. In fact, Peter begins his letter addressing his readers as exiles, just like Daniel and his companions. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. Uh, here's the difference. In the Old Testament, exile was a geographical term, just like we would use it today. If you were displaced from your home, um, if you were exiled from where you lived, you were in exile. It's really a geographical term. Peter uses it in this way a little bit, but even more so, Peter uses it as a spiritual term. Peter is pointing out that in one way, we are all living in a home away from home. Like this world is good and beautiful. This world is part of God's creation. Like we, we have families and make lives and do work and it matters, right? What you do matters. But this world is marred by sin. This world is broken. So God promises a new heavens and a new earth that's to come. Peter's gonna talk about what's kept in heaven for us. And so in some ways, this is our home away from home, and it means that we're gonna run up against things that sometimes make us feel um, stressed or afraid or even out of place, like we don't fully belong here. And as we move through this letter, what we find is Peter doesn't let us off the hook when things get difficult by telling us, well, hey, when it's hard, you can just withdraw from the world. Peter doesn't give us that option. Peter also doesn't get a, give us the option of fully assimilating into the dominant culture where we just kind of go, hey, well, whatever's going around the world, that's just what's gonna go on in my life. Instead, he says, as followers of Christ, we have the responsibility of critically engaging our culture in strategic ways so that we can have an impact on the world in which we live. And, and a, a lot of authors, a lot of uh, thinkers and, and speakers have sometimes described what Peter is getting at as, as having a missionary encounter with our culture. Now, we sometimes think of missionaries as people that we send away from, you know, from our church or from domestically. We send to live in a foreign land. Peter says, in one sense, we all live in a foreign land. Uh, we live in a home away from home. We are exiles. And if you are a follower of Christ, you have a mission for as long as you live here on this earth, therefore, in some ways, you are a missionary. And we are called to have an impact. And so what does a faithful missionary encounter look like? I wanna end the message by just briefly talking about that and setting up, in many ways, this series. And we gotta start by kinda of getting rid of the two extremes. What does a faithful missionary encounter look like? On one extreme, it's not withdrawal. Now, what do I mean by withdrawal? You, you can think of a community like, um, like, like, the, like the Amish, Community, And that's not to say anything bad about the Amish community, the wonderful community, hard workers, um, family-oriented, but, but they're not trying to critically engage their culture, right? They've, and more have chosen withdrawal as, as a testimony um, against the culture, as kind of, you know, protecting their culture, but it's not an attempt to critically engage the culture. So on one extreme, a missionary encounter is not withdrawal, on the other extreme, we might say that a missionary encounter is not hostile takeover, right? We're just like, we're just gonna take over the world around us. This would be things like um, Sharia law. This would be things like even a hardline Christian nationalism, a hardline Hindu nationalism, which is um, very prevalent in India right now, where you say like, we're going to make people by force behave what we believe. That's, that's also not, an engagement with culture that is a takeover. A missionary encounter seeks to confront the culture in which we live, but it also seeks to convert. 
So it is both offensive in that it challenges some of the commonly held beliefs of the day, and yet it's also at the same time inviting and attractive because you were loving your community and you were offering a better vision of life than people can find elsewhere. And so it's, 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 not, it's like threading a needle in many ways. It's not an easy thing to do. And New Testament scholar Larry Hurtado, he gives us a picture of what this looked like in the early church. In his book, The Destroyer of the Gods, and he means the destroyer of like the, the Roman Greek pantheon of gods, he, he asked the question, how did a small segment of Jesus' followers manage to make their mark on the massive Roman Empire? So in other words, um, how did that small stone not cut by human hands grow to fill the whole earth and outlast some of the best man-made kingdoms the world has ever known? Christianity grew from around 120 believers shortly after Jesus' death in Acts chapter 1 to the world's largest faith community. How did this take place? And on one level, we need to say there's a supernatural element to this for sure. It's the spirit of God at work in the world and the lives of people. But as far as the part of the church goes, Hurtado lists five ways. Five ways the early church had a missionary encounter with their culture. They critically engaged the world around them while also standing out. Let's look at these very briefly, these five things, and then I'm gonna close. Number one, he says they were far more multi-ethnic and multiracial than any community the world had known. Christianity, especially early on, was far less tribal far less ethnically or geographically constrained. It had the remarkable ability and still has the remarkable, remarkable ability today to spread into different cultures and embed in different cultures and sort of take root there. And when Christianity is at its strongest, it also has the ability to unite different cultures together around the person and work of Jesus Christ. So he says they were, they were early on far more multi-ethnic and multiracial than any other community. Number two, he says they were far more committed to the poor and marginalized than the world had ever seen. The Roman Emperor Julian was famous for saying, he goes, you know the problem with Christians? You know why they're growing so quickly? He says, they don't only care for their own poor, they care for our poor too. And it was that type of love and generosity of spirit that really made a mark on the Roman world and caused people to take notice. It grabbed their attention. So far more committed to the poor and marginalized. Number three, Hurtado says the early Christians, they were marked by non-retaliation and forgiveness. In other words, if you burn down a Christian's home because of their faith, which happened in the, the early centuries and in some parts of the world happens today, or if you persecuted them in some way, they didn't turn around and burn your home down. Instead, they took Jesus' words to heart. They practiced what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount about turning the other cheek. And so they were marked by non-retaliation and forgiveness. Number four, Hurtado talks about how the early Christians were positively against abortion and infant exposure. Now, I'm gonna talk just for a brief moment about this, and I also recognize in our community, I'm certain there are people who are here who are listening who at a point in their life have, have had an abortion themselves, and so I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to cast shame in this moment. I'm not, um, that's not my intention. I want you to know that you were welcome here and you were loved, but I'm gonna talk about how the church responded to this in the early centuries. In the, in the Roman Empire, abortion existed, but it was not, all, it was not at all safe for the mother. Certainly not for the child, but even not at all safe for the mother. And so what would typically happen if a mother and father did not want a baby is they would, they would deliver the baby and then they would set it upon a garbage heap. And one of two things would happen to that child. The child would either die there on the garbage heap or someone would come along and they would take that child and they would sell it into slavery. And so this was a very common practice. And what Hurtado notes, and you can find people writing about this in all sorts of ancient literature, he talks about how the Christians were positively against infant exposure and that the church didn't just forbid women from having an abortion. They actually went out, found kids who were placed upon these heaps, brought them home, took care of them, and raised them as their own. So in other words, they were committed to the problem and they were invested in a solution. And this was not only a testimony to the world of the love of God, it also raised up entire generations of children who understood what it meant to be rescued by a heavenly father and adopted into a family. So it made a huge impact in those early days, the love and the work of the, the Christians in the church. And then number five, Hurtado says this. He says that the early Christians offered a sexual counterculture. The early church was far stricter in the area of sexual ethics than the world around them. And even though what they taught proved a whole lot stricter, 
um, the underlying vision and value of what sexuality is and what it, me what it means to be a sexual being proved to be far more attractive. Things like uh, monogamy and chastity and not using your position of power or authority to, to take advantage of someone else. This ended up becoming the dominant view and it's carried on all the way till today where it's starting to be challenged again. But the Christians offered this remarkable sexual counterculture that was very inviting to the people around them. Now, those are the five things Hurtado gives. Here's what I want you to notice. Two of those five points sound a lot like how modern Democrats would try to do things. Racial and economic justice. Two of the five sound a lot like how conservative Republicans would do things. Pro-life and a tr traditional sexual ethic. And the one on non-retaliation and forgiveness, dare I say, doesn't sound much like either political party or a whole lot of politicians that I know. And here's the sober reality. There are many Christians who would like to drop or be willing to drop the two that don't fit neatly into their party of choice. But here's where we have to fight to keep our eyes higher. And what we need to see is one of the best ways to demonstrate the truth of the gospel is to show that Jesus creates a people and Jesus creates a community that breaks through all the traditional human categories. That's how you have a, a missionary encounter and a witness to the world. And it's what, what Paul's talking about in Ephesians chapter three when he says God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That's that witness. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. And this type of citizenship, where our heavenly identity calls us to, to category-breaking cultural engagement on this earth, this is really, really, really hard work. And it's often slow work, and it always starts Small, and it can feel at times like we are losing ground trying to do kingdom work as, as kind of big powers clash all around us. But I remind you, this has been the vision of God's kingdom from the very beginning. Daniel chapter two, the small stone that would grow to fill the whole earth. God's call upon Abraham in Genesis 12. Jesus told the story, parable of the mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds that grows to become the largest of all plants, just all these pictures of the small, seemingly insignificant kingdom, which would grow to outlast all the other man-made kingdoms and fill the earth. And here's the final truth. Not only will God's kingdom live forever, but if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it means you will live forever through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Peter calls this our living hope in the very opening of his letter. And so I'm going to invite you to stand with me as I read these words and then close us in a time of prayer. This is how 1 Peter begins the letter that we will be looking at over the next few weeks. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles, so this home is not our forever home, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, in, light of the, in light of the living hope that Jesus offers, what do you need to start looking at from God's perspective rather than your own? Is there anything that you need to repent from so that you can believe God's truth? It, finances, marriage, career, retirement, sexuality, friendships, politics, you and I can trust, we're gonna face various trials. But we can also trust God will one, things, one day make things right and new. And it's this vision God give us, gives us that offers us hope. And so church, let's keep our eyes higher. Let's keep our hands active. Let's keep our hearts and minds engaged. Let's be prayerful, charitable, and loving. Let's serve our community. And let's trust that in all of this, God is at work to grow his kingdom, amen?
Man, let me pray this over us today. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are in control when we are not. We thank you that in the midst of what sometimes can feel like chaos, you are steady and faithful. And Lord, you and your kingdom will one day win the day. And this means that we um, don't get to withdraw and just sit on our hands. It also means that we don't have to try to do by force the things that only you can do. Help us to be faithful, faithfully engaged with the world around us as we live out our faith in Jesus. And may his power be evident in our lives individually and collectively for your glory and for the benefit of our communities. We pray this in the holy and powerful name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. We're gonna have a time of response this morning uh, like we do each week. Um, you know, we're gonna sing, and today if, uh, if you just wanna sing in response to God's word from a, from a deep place of gratitude for what God has done, I'd invite you to do that. Um, today, if you've got a burden on your heart, something you've been thinking about a lot, personal perhaps, for a friend or even for, for our country and world, and you just wanna come um, release some of that at, at the altar, I would invite you to do that. I'm gonna be down here praying, so if you come, you're not gonna be by yourself. And I would hope as a church, we'd be prayerful entering into this fall, and I hope that you'll join me in prayer today. Um, after we have the opportunity to respond, we'll take the Lord's Supper together. And then um, we always, this weekend before school starts in our community, we spend a moment um, recognizing and praying for all the adults who are gonna be pouring into young people this year. And so um, we have plenty of time. I hope that you won't rush out yet. I hope you'll stay for that. We'll take a few minutes to pray over those folks. But let's not rush through this time. Would you come as we sing?
the way that we um, run home to uh, our Father, our Heavenly Father, is through His Son. Jesus Christ described Himself as the way, the truth, and life, and the way that we are reconnected with our um, Creator, uh, a holy and perfect God, which we sang about earlier, is through the grace and forgiveness that Jesus offers um, on the cross. He took our sin on the cross. Uh, he went to the grave with Him. He rose on the third day. He's defeated. Uh, death and defeated anything that could get its hold on us in this life. And so even though some of that we believe by faith now, we believe that one day um, we will be with him forever as we were meant to be. And if you believe that this is true, um, that the cross is central to our faith and Jesus is the son of God, I would invite you to take the bread this morning and to break and to eat and remember Jesus's body broken for you, his, his church. Let's break and eat together. We take the juice and we drink and we remember the blood of Jesus shed for the forgiveness of sins. Let's take and drink and remember Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. If you would um, grab a seat just, just for a, a moment, we would typically um, dismiss right around this time. I wanna take just a moment. Uh, next hour we'll celebrate um, a baptism at 1045. I want to let you know about that. Also, want to let you know afterward if you've got a decision on your heart, you want to talk with someone about a relationship with Jesus, or you could just use some prayer. I'll be down front afterward with some pastors. We'd love to pray for you. Um, right now, we like to take this moment uh, heading into the, the first week of school in our community to acknowledge um, all those folks who pour into the next generation um, and invest in them uh, in our educational system, both, both public schools. Um, private schools, even if you're part of like a homeschool co-op and you're involved in leadership of that in some way, um, we would love to acknowledge you this morning. And I, I, I had prepared to be an educator before I felt called to ministry. And so, uh, I, you know, I, I have a heart for educators to begin with, but this is also you, whether you're a teacher, coach, um, administrator, principal, uh, work in the cafeteria, bus driver, aide in the classroom, there are kids who walk into your room and into your space who may not have anybody else who believe in them. Um, they may not know that anyone else sees them. They may not know that they matter, certainly to other people, but even to, even to God. And you have been put in their life to, to teach them math and science and English and history. And like those, those things are beautiful and good, but also to remind them that they're not alone. There are people who care about them and love them. And right now, you probably have a lot of optimism for a new year. I imagine it's an exciting time. That will probably be, that balloon might be popped by Thursday. Who knows how that will go? Um, that's okay, right? The most important callings in life, and you certainly have a calling, uh, they're not easy callings. And so this prayer for you also is today just a reminder that when it gets difficult, you know, not to give up because you don't know the ripple effects that you will have. And we'll talk about this a little bit more next week in Daniel 1 because we see some of that in Daniel's life, but we want to acknowledge and pray for you today. So if you serve in any way, any capacity with young people in our schools, private, public, homeschool, co-op, would you just stand for a moment? We want to, one, thank you, acknowledge you for what you do, and we also want to pray for you. So would you stand with us? Go ahead and do so. We are incredibly thankful for you. Please, please stay standing if you would. If you're comfortable to stay standing, I would, we want to pray for you now. If you're near them and you know them, and, um, and you ask, can I just put my hand on your shoulder or something, um, that would be great. We'd invite you to do so. If you don't know them, ask first. It might be uncomfortable for them if you don't. And, um, and respect it if they say, no, thank you, right? Like, I take your prayer, but not your hand. No, thank you. So uh, let, let's, let's pray together for them, for our students also, and for the year that will begin. God, we love you so much, and we're thankful, Lord, that we get to use our life in some way to make an impact for others. We talked a lot about that today. Um, broadly for our world, but also for, it happens for individuals. And so God, I pray for all those who are standing, who are part of our schools, um, who are serving others, investing in young people. I pray that you would give them a keen insight into their students. I pray that you would give them the love and compassion that they need, the patience that they need, the firmness that they need. I pray that you'd help them navigate the world of interacting with parents and navigating some of the complexities of their jobs and, and their faith in those environments. And I pray, God, that you would help them have um, a wonderful year where they can see a lot of the fruit that they accomplish, but also trust there is fruit that's coming down the road they will never get to see, um, but some of that is the most important work. 
And I pray on the days that they're tired, you would put just the right person in their path, just the right encouragement for them to keep going. And um, I pray that they feel your support and the support of our church. Lord, I pray for our young people who will be going to school. I pray that they could be a light. Um, I pray that they could be a positive influence on their friends. I pray that they'll have good friends and be good friends. I pray, Lord, that they would, um, they would learn and grow and also hold strong to what they believe about you. And I just pray wonderful years and protection and safety in our community um, and the communities around us this year. We pray all these things in the holy and powerful name of Jesus Christ. All God's people said, amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next weekend. God bless.